So, um, hello everybody. Um, it is um, afternoon in here in London. I'm not quite sure where you're all joining us from. Um, so it um, might be good morning and good afternoon and good evening, but welcome to this um, joint Wiener Holocaust Library and Holocaust and Genocide Research Partnership um, event today. And I'm Barbara Warnock from the Wiener Holocaust Library and me and my colleague Christine are joining you from there. And yes, we're, we're in central London in Russell Square near the British Museum. And we are really delighted today to be presenting this, this important new book um, and hosting this book launch for um, Colonial Paradigms of Violence, Comparative Analysis of the Holocaust, Genocide and Mass Killing. So it's a really um, timely and fascinating and broad ranging book that we're going to be considering today. Um, we, we're joined today by um, the editors, also a couple of the contributors, as well as by a commentator. And I'll introduce them all properly um, in a moment. So just to say that this event is part of um, an ongoing series that the library has been doing for a few years um, on um, racism, antisemitism, colonial and genocide, uh, colonialism and genocide. And if you'd like to find out more about that event series, you can have a look on the library's website. Um, and also there's some recordings of some of the events on YouTube as well. And they're about a range of different um, topics. So clearly this book is very relevant for that event series. Um, this event today, as I've said, is, is, is in partnership um, with the Holocaust and Genocide Research Partnership. And this partnership is a collaboration between the Wiener Holocaust Library and the, the Holocaust Research Institute at Royal Holloway University of London. And its primary mi mission is to reframe public engagement, education, and heritage, pra heritage practice about the history and memory of the Holocaust and genocide. And the activities of the HGRP are partly funded by the uh, Ernest Hecht Charitable Foundation, um, to whom the partnership are extremely grateful. So that's just a little bit of information today. In terms of the library itself, um, we're an archive and a library in an exhibition space in central London. We're one of the world's oldest archival collections on the Nazi era and the Holocaust. So obviously it's extremely relevant to us to be doing uh, this event. And so if, if you're not from um, London, but are ever in London, then please come along and visit. And we have a busy program of exhibitions and events and you can find out more on our website. Um, so, um, Turning to just a few um, practical matters, um, the audience are all muted. We will have a little bit of a chance for people to the audience to pose questions towards the end of the event, and you can put your questions um, in the chat, and we'll try and get to as many of those as possible. We're, we're recording this event today, um, and um, a recording will be available at some point afterwards on our YouTube channel. You can. Um, you can um, use closed captions if you would like um, during this event. Just, just a word of warning that you know these are kind of simultaneously done and so they're not going to be necessarily accurate and they sometimes kind of misrepresent slightly what people are saying, but it, it may be helpful um, to some of you. Um, so to turn now to the to the book. So um, the book um, originally emerged um, out of um, um, a, a workshop on colonial paradigms of violence that was originally held in November 2020. And the book collects together a really kind of wide ranging um, selection of, of articles um, which look at how fruitful academic research can be in bridging the gap between studies of empire and the Holocaust. Um, but also offers assessments of the potential analytical weaknesses and pitfalls of such an approach. And I think, as many of you in the audience may be aware, these kind of discussions and, and debates are particularly um, timely and have attracted a certain amount of um, contentious debate and commentary in recent times. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from you know, different speakers and different perspectives um, in the event today. Um, and you know, allowing us to kind of consider these these sometimes potentially difficult um, difficult discussions. So I'm going to introduce all the speakers at the start of the event, and just just to say a word about the structure. 
Um, so we're fortunate enough today to be joined by Professor Thomas Kuna, and he will be offering comment a commentary on the volume to start the event. We will then be hearing from the editors of the volume, Michelle Gordon and Rachel O'Sullivan, and they'll be both presenting about the book and its origins and ideas and some of, uh, some of its kind of relevance for current debates. Um, and then we'll be hearing um, from uh, two of the contributors. So these are Alexander um, Stepan and also Dorota uh, Glovatska. And um, so we'll be hearing from them about their specific individual chapters. There'll then be a bit of a discussion between panelists. Um, and then we'll have a little bit of time, hopefully, towards the end for any questions from the audience. So I'm now going to um, introduce the speakers before I hand over um, to Thomas, first of all. So Thomas Kuhn is Strassler Colin Flew Chair in the Study of Holocaust History and the Director of the Strassler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Clark University. His research explores the relation of war, genocide and society, long-term traditions of political culture and political emotions in Europe, and the problem of locating the Holocaust and Nazi Germany in the continuities and discontinuities of the 20th century. His recent public publications include monographs, The Rise and Fall of Comradeship, Hitler's Soldiers, Male Bonding and Mass Violence in the 20th Century, and Belonging in Genocide, Hitler's Community, 1918 to 1945. Rachel O'Sullivan is a postdoctoral researcher at the Center of Holocaust Studies, Leibniz, in Leibniz Institute for Contemporary History in Munich. Um, she is published in the Journal of Genocide Research, the Journal of Colonialism, and colonial history and other places. She's currently working on her first monograph on similarities and dissimilarities between colonialism and Nazi Germany's inclusionary and exclusionary population policies in annexed Poland. Michelle Gordon is a researcher at the Hugo Valentine Center at Uppsala University, Sweden, and currently heads the project, um, The Civilized Nature of 19th Century Warfare, Britain and German, British and German Practices of Violence, in colonial and inter-European wars. She is the author of Extreme Violence and the British Way, Colonial Warfare in Perak, Sierra Leone and, Sierra Leone and Sudan. Published as part of Bloomsbury's Empire's Other History series in 2020. And if you'd like to know more about that volume, Michelle um, spoke about it at a previous library event that you can find on our YouTube channel. So Alexandra um, Shepan is a literary scholar, co-founder and member of the Research Centre for Memory Cultures at the Yarralengian University in Krakow and a collaborator of the United States Holocaust Memorial, More, Memorial Museum and Oral History Projects in Poland and Spain. Um, she co-authored the book Realista Robert Greeley in 2015 on 20th century redefinitions of realism. She has been a recipient of scholarships from the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies, the USHMN, um, the European Holocaust Re Research Infrastructure and Polish National Science Center. And she's currently working on a book dedicated to the role of maps in Holocaust testimony. Um, so um, Dorota Globatska is, is Professor of Humanities at University of King's College. Um, Halifax, Canada. She's the, the author of um, From the Other Side, Testimony, Effect, Imagination, um, which I'm saying in English, it's actually in Polish, but I'm not going to attempt the Polish version, version sorry. Um, and Disappearing Traces, Holocaust Testimonials, Ethics and Aesthetics. She co-edited Imaginary Neighbours, um, Mediating Polish-Jewish Relations After the Holocaust and Between Ethics and Aesthetics, Crossing the Boundaries, and edited a special issue of Cultural Machine entitled community. Glovac has um, published numerous book chapters, journal articles, reviews and encyclopedia entries in the area of Holocaust and Genocide Studies, Critical Theory and Theories of Gender. She is a member of the Academic Committee at the Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Research at USHMM and her current research focuses on gender and genocide and on the intersections of the Holocaust and settler colonial genocides in North America. So um, I, now that I've introduced all our speakers, we'll turn to them. So we're going to hear first from Thomas, then from Michelle and Rachel, the editors, um, and um, then from Alexander and then from Dorota, I believe. So I'll hand over now to um, Thomas for his opening comments. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> it's an honor for me to be part of this panel. 
And I want to thank the Wiener Holocaust Library and especially Barbara Wernock for inviting me. The topic of our event, the relation between colonialism and the Holocaust is contentious. The question at stake is whether the Holocaust can or must be understood in the context of German or European traditions of colonialism and whether this colonial paradigm leads to a new master narrative <clears throat> of the murder of the European Jews. Holocaust in this context is typically understood in a broad fashion, including terror on several groups, not only the Jews, including the, con the Nazi conquest of the, e of the East and so on. Scholars who insist on such a relation suggest that we track back the roots of Nazi violence, not so much to traditions of racism and anti-Semitism, or to the brutalizing experience of the First World War, or to radical nationalist and fascist ideologies, but rather to Europe's and Germany's colonial and imperial past. This argument is contentious for three reasons. It questions, first, the historical significance and some may say uniqueness of the Holocaust. Second, it questions established, especially legally codified, ideas about the concept of genocide. And thirdly, it questions today's memory politics, namely whether the Holocaust should be at the core of these memory politics. Now, famously, Hannah Arendt, in her 1951 book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, and about at the same time, also black diaspora and leftist intellectuals such as Aimé Césaire, Franz Fanon, or Jean-Paul Sartre argued that Europeans' experience with colonialism in Africa and Asia informed the Holocaust. Colonial ra uh, racism had, in Arendt's words, boomerang effects on European societies. More recently, some 20 years ago, the German historian Jürgen Zimmerer argued that German colonialism, especially the genocide in Namibia in 1904 to 07, established a continuity that led into the Holocaust. And since then, a diverse group of scholars has argued in similar ways, often by focusing especially on American or Australian settler colonialism and not specifically on German experiences. The advocates of this colonial paradigm of Holocaust studies point to personal continuities and or the transfer of knowledge of imageries and fantasies from colonialism to the Holocaust. So do two contributions to the book that is subject of our panel. Sarah Elos examines three doctors who began their careers with colonial practices of disease control to then conduct inhuman medical experiments in Nazi-occupied Europe. Carol or Pete Kegel <coughs> illustrates Hitler's romanticized view of the American Wild West informed, among other by the German popular author Karl May, and how ideas or fantasies about frontier expansion, settlement, and colonization inspired Nazi expansion in the East. While such personal and ideological connections certainly existed, <clears throat> most scholars today agree that they were marginal or at least cannot explain the full dimension of Nazi violence and conquest. Hitler, for instance, was driven more by fantasies about colonialism than precise knowledge, and those colonial fantasies had impact only in conjunction with other violent fantasies, legions, imageries, pieces of knowledge, about the Armenian genocide, about British colonialism in India, quite different from settler colonialism in North America, about uh, Genghis Khan's wars that preceded for hundreds of years the European colonial wars, but didn't lack much of their destructiveness, and so on and so forth. In the Nazi violent imagery, colonialism was just one of many metaphors of brutality, ruthlessness, and contempt of humanity, symbols that served to endow the monstrosity of the Nazi genocide and conquest with a myth of universal warfare in the spirit of social Darwinism, and so this way, this way to justify the Nazi conquest and genocide. Instead of causal continuities, research under the colonial paradigm now, and also in this book, rather examines, I quote from the introduction, 
similarities, entanglements, and commonalities between colonialism and Nazi violence. Most chapters in our book follow this line. Jadwiga Biskupska deploys the concept of settler colonialism to analyze Nazi violence in and around the city of Samos in the Lublin district. She distinguishes five phases, initial Jewish reservation, then second, the mass extermination of Jews, third, the deportation and resettlement of Polish peasantry, fourth, the establishment of a German warrior settler colony, and fifth, a period of anti-Nazi insurgency Oh, and overall little effective German anti-partisan warfare. This essay demonstrates that concepts drawn from inquiry into colonialism may support nuanced analysis of Nazi violence. Yet, I am not really convinced that the search for or the identification of similarities, entanglements, and commonalities between Holocaust and colonialism really helps explain the Holocaust. Biskupska too admits to, I quote, the limitations of settler colonialism as an explanatory, explanatory framework to analyze the Nazi Eastern European experiment. I will come back to these limitations. Before I do that, let me address two enormously important benefits of it. One is that inquiries into commonalities between colonial violence and the Holocaust have convincingly questioned narrow definitions of the concept of genocide, especially the one of the 1948 UN Convention. In this volume, Jack Palmer examines the aporias of Raphael Lemkin's thinking about the concept, and Dorota Glowatska ponders the usefulness of the concept of cultural genocide. Both contribute to a widespread debate, most powerful currently led by Dirk Moses, a debate that probably will lead to foregoing the concept of genocide altogether when it comes to analyze causes, processes, and consequences of events of mass violence. That the concept of genocide is yet needed in judicial and political concept, genocide prevention, trials against perpetrators and others, is a different issue here. The second benefit of the colonial paradigm in Holocaust studies is not limited to explaining history, but plays out in the realm of present politics and more precisely in the way the present remembers the past, that is, which parts of the past, only or primarily the Holocaust or other uh, evil pasts as well, and if so, how does collective memory arranges these different strands of evil pasts? In this volume, Edward Kissy, Tom Lawson, Ulrike Lindner, and Miriam Zadov discuss how in Germany, Britain, and the US, the Holocaust domination of memory politics continues but is increasingly challenged by efforts to put respective countries' colonial pasts on the agenda as well. Now let me talk a little about the limitations of the colonial paradigm in Holocaust studies. Somewhat surprising, the methodology of comparison has been utilized only rarely by studies under the colonial paradigm, and if I'm not mistaken, not much in this book either. Comparison means not only detecting similarities or commonalities. It means instead to juxtapose similarities on the one hand and differences on the other in order to better understand each of the compared units. Methodologically rigid comparisons require concisely defined categories, which <clears throat> I think are often lacking in studies under the colonial paradigm. Colonial violence was in many cases genocidal and the Nazi project of war, conquest and extermination, especially in the East, resembled in many regards what Europeans did before in their colonies. But there were also massive differences, especially if one considers that there were many types of colonialism. <clears throat> we should distinguish between these different types of colonialism if you want to draw comparisons with the Nazi conquest and genocide. <clears throat> when it comes to inquiring into the roots and reasons of Nazi violence, differentiation, not generalization, is uh, required, in my view. <clears throat> Nazi occupation and rule over Europe took different, sometimes opposing shapes, in fact, a special one in each country. The Nazis persecuted, murdered, humiliated, subjugated Europeans in many different ways, depending on which racial status the Nazis 
assigned to them. <clears throat> um, I, th I think that you and the audience are familiar with these differences. There are continuities and parallels, for instance, anti-partisan warfare in occupied Eastern Europe was used as cover for the mass shooting of Jews. And this may be linked to the tradition of colonial wars, including the so-called Indian wars in North America. Overall, however, the extermination of Jew European Jewry does not fit any of the colonial patterns. And this is the weakest part of the colonial paradigm of Holocaust studies. Explaining the murder of Jews in terms of colonialism or imperialism rather than anti-Semitism, racist nationalism, or as a radicalization of the eugenics movement has not led to convincing results. Distinguishing the Nazis' obsession with eventually killing all Jews in Europe and probably beyond Europe, and the same might be said about their policy against Roma and Sinti, is different from other genocides. This assessment is not meant to revive the mythology of the uniqueness of the Holocaust. The point here is not to assign uniqueness, but to honor difference. Let me summarize four aspects. First, the colonial paradigm leaves no doubt that the Holocaust is not the only evil past that needs to be remembered, but that Western societies look back on a plethora of, either, of other evils that need to feed into current politics and cultures of remembrance, remembrance just as much. Second, at least for scholarly purposes, a narrow concept of genocide is dysfunctional. Third, when it comes to explain the Holocaust and Nazi violence more largely, the identification of commonalities between Holocaust and colonialism is of limited help unless colonial violence is seen and analyzed as embedded in even older traditions of ruthless warfare including the destruction of entire peoples or at least civilians. Fourth, instead of searching for commonalities between Holocaust and colonialism, rigid comparisons, the juxtaposition of commonalities and differences seems most promising if you want to move forward with the colonial paradigm in Holocaust studies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Thomas, that was a um, really fascinating, really useful way, um, I think, to sort of start off our discussions about the book. So I'm now going to hand over to Michelle and Rachel, um, the editors, for them to tell us um, a bit more about the book. <clears throat> OK, um, hi, everybody. Um, thank you, first of all, uh, to the Wiener Holocaust Library, Barbara and Christine in particular, uh, for once again giving such a great platform to these issues. Um, and of course, thank you very much to Professor Thomas Kuhner for giving us such a careful and thoughtful assessment of both the book and the debate, which I will of course try to add to without um, overlapping too much with uh, what has already been an excellent overview of the kinds of issues that the book is trying to deal with. So for those of you that haven't, had the book in their hands yet. Um, here's an overview of, um, of the table of contents. And so, as you can see then, um, we have a mix of research articles, the round table, which uh, Thomas mentioned. Uh, we also have a source commentary and a number of project descriptions to try and give a real sense of the, the different ways in which uh, scholars are trying to deal with these, these issues. We've tried to have a mixture of disciplines, so historians of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust, but also colonial and imperial history. Uh, there's a sociologist, political scientist, et cetera, et cetera. So, and hopefully you can see from the, from the table of contents there that we have tried to provide a range in terms of, of dealing with these issues. And we also didn't want all the contributions to solely uh, focus on these academic arguments about continuity and comparability and discontinuities, but rather to include things such as the round table, which also bring aspects of present day Holocaust remembrance, culture and entanglements between memory, national discourses and politics to the fore. Mm -hmm. So we thought it would be important to, to provide this uh, varied overview of topics, methodologies, etc. So uh, just to focus on our aims then, again, just, just briefly, this is uh, what Rachel and I will discuss before 
getting into the the debates of, of the topic as highlighted by Thomas. So um, again, some of this has already been mentioned, uh, but the issue of Holocaust comparability then. So of course, this has been discussed for a long time, as, as Thomas has shown, since the post-war period. And there are, of course, opponents to this comparative approach, and particularly in relation to this issue of comparing the Holocaust. Um, Thomas also mentioned, and we would uh, also strengthen this notion that we don't go back to this idea of a specific uniqueness, uh, because of course all historical events have their own specific unique qualities, but they also have precedents, of course. So while there is some great resistance to this kind of comparative approach and, and the idea that the Holocaust somehow shouldn't be understood within wider processes of history and context and of other cases of violence, this, this notion has persisted, but we wanted to try and bring some counterbalance to this idea. So as um, Thomas has already mentioned, then of course, in the early 2000s, we had this um, discussion particularly related um, most famously maybe by Jürgen Zimmerer with his Windhoek to Nach Auschwitz. And this idea then of a return of violence from the colonies to Europe. And this uh, notion of um, the Nazi regime and the Holocaust is potentially influenced by colonial ideology and practices or notions of imitations or direct contact, um, connections as, as Thomas mentioned. So, but of course, in this, we're not only discussing um, what this tells us about the Holocaust, and we're also not looking directly from the Kaiserreich to the Holocaust either. So, um, within our introduction, Rachel and I discussed a little bit about this, this idea of the language of uh, colonialism already being apparent within the literature on the Holocaust. So, there is a lot of, um, there are a lot of historians that already kind of use this language of empire without necessarily drawing on colonial comparisons. So they don't explicitly locate their work within the margins of these wider discussions. Um, and they don't necessarily unpack the terms that they are using. Um, we also wanted to show that increasingly recent research is moving away from investigations of direct, direct continuity and taking a more flexible approach, particularly with regards to the idea of what is genocide and um, yes, being able to create, ascertain wider patterns of policy domination and violence. But of course, there are still historians that would dispute this. Um, so just to show then, in terms of this more flexible approach, we have Donald Bloxham's work, Dan Stone. Um, but in contrast to that, Stefan Cleavers, for example, who is very um, critical of, of this approach, of this uh, context. Um, and the way in which colonial, the colonial paradigm helps us to understand other genocides and the Holocaust specifically. So just to give an overview then to the, to the academic debate on genocide. So of course the other side of this then is how do colonial historians or genocide scholars approach such comparisons? And of course the term genocide itself is very complex and has its roots of course in Raphael Lemkin's definition, but as Thomas, uh, Thomas said, the 1948 definition is the legal definition that we have. But of course, um, historians using more kind of flexible definitions uh, to, to the convention, um, but work on colonialism is then challenging notions of, of, of the Holocaust as this archetypal genocide somehow and how that influences the ways in which scholars think about mass violence and notions of the Holocaust as a yardstick for genocide, for example. So in terms of the historiography on the colonial side, then it's often the case that colonial historians either shy away or openly dispute just the concept of genocide as useful to an analysis of empire. So while the concept of genocide has uh, colonial roots in its understanding, historians often don't apply this within the field. And of course, genocide is not the only tool for understanding colonial violence. It's just that we argue that it is one important one. So just to give you an example, then some of the um, works that are working on the, uh, that are trying to deal with these issues, of course, Dirk Moses has mentioned, uh, Dan Stone and uh, Tom Lawson, for example. Um, one of the problems with uh, genocide and the definition is how, the lack of flexibility in terms of understanding such things as settler colonialism and colonial genocide, because of course, 
the definition and our understanding of genocide is very much related to this notion of intent. And of course, in a colonial context, it wasn't necessarily the state, but rather settlers and individuals that were perpetrating genocidal massacres or these kind of wider practices. So um, again, this is just one of the challenges that we, we wanted to highlight. But of course, many argue that um, genocide is always colonial, but of course, we need not then def therefore conclude that colonialism is always genocidal. Um, so this, yes, it, but we argue that it's, it's a conversation worth having, which we hope the book will help to stimulate this further. So that's the, um, the academic debates and I'll just hand over to Rachel briefly so she can give an overview of the uh, more cultural debates that are going on in the memory wars. I'll just stop sharing my screen here, thank you. So I hope everyone can see that. Um, thank you also from my side to the Wiener Holocaust Library and also to Professor Kuna for his comments and thoughts. Um, so Professor Kuna has touched on some of these um, aspects in, in his part of the, the talk, but I'll also briefly cover them. Um, and that is aspects of the public debate uh, because they really formed the background to the, the thought process behind this volume, but also actually the, the writing of this volume. A lot of this was ongoing as we were collecting the contributions, as we were editing the contributions. And um, I will specifically focus on debates within Germany and the United Kingdom. So as Michelle has mentioned, the debates on Holocaust uniqueness and possible ways to compare it to other genocides have been circulating in the academic sphere for a significant length of time. However, the public debates on Holocaust uniqueness and comparability, that is debates outside of academia, have largely yet to catch up with the academic ones. An example of this was the case of Akhil Membembe, the Cameroonian post-colonial scholar who was invited as an opening speaker at a cultural festival in Germany in 2020. Later, his invitation was withdrawn because of public objections and accusations of anti-Semitism against Membembe made by Felix Klein, the German anti-Semitism anti commissioner. Klein's objections were based on Mbembe's signing of a BDS petition and on what Klein described as Mbembe's relativizing of the Holocaust in his work. Mbembe had indicated similarities between South Africa's apartheid system and the Holocaust, which, according to Klein, is prohibited in view of the unprecedented crimes during the Nazi era, in particular given Germany's historical responsibility for them. That's um, some of the media coverage of the Mimbe case. Um, then in May 2021, the Australian historian Dirk Moses wrote an online piece called The German Catechism, which criticized the German state and media's approach to Holocaust memory. He claimed that the memory of the Holocaust as a break with civilization is the moral foundation of the German Federal Republic. And to compare the Holocaust with other genocides is considered to be a heresy within Germany. Moses ultimately argued that it's time to abandon this approach. The German mainstream media reaction to Mbembe and Moses largely highlighted that despite what academic scholarship has demonstrated for years, German mainstream media, certain journalists, commentators, and even some renowned historians were not yet ready or willing to relinquish the idea that national socialist violence and the Holocaust are incomparable. The prominence of Holocaust education and remembrance culture, alongside a scarcity of information, education, and memorization of other violent events, is not a German phenomenon, however. Rather, it is common within former empires. To take the United Kingdom as, as an example, during the preparation of this volume, the predominant narrative regarding the significance of the Holocaust came to light in the form of debates surrounding the building of a Holocaust Memorial and Learning Centre in Victoria Tower Gardens, right beside the British House of Parliament. Although planning permission for the memorial was ultimately refused in April 2020, the initial plans raised many significant criticisms and questions. As 42 UK-based UK Holocaust historians and scholars of Jewish studies noted in an open letter in September 2020, situating the UK Holocaust Memorial so close to Parliament is almost certain to add to the mythology of Britain alone as the ultimate saviour of the Jews, 
which negates several decades of careful scholarship and research. Other critics pointed out how London already has a Holocaust Memorial in Hyde Park, and a 15 minute walk away, the Imperial War Museum recently reopened and expanded permanent Holocaust and Second World War exhibition. As such, it begged the question, could the money be better spent on funding research projects, exhibitions, memorials, or learning centers, which cover Britain's own history of expansion, racism, and violence during its year as, years as an imperial power? Judging by the recent appeals by the British government against the refusal of planning permission, they disagree. To return to the example of Germany, despite its rather short period of ruling overseas, Colonialism, that is both German and European colonialism in general, has fed into German societal structures, politics and institutions. In recent years, initiatives have sought to decolonize German city landscapes, institutions and museums, and certain research projects, for example, the project on the history of Innerstrasse 22, led by Manuela Bauche, which features in this volume's project description section, are better highlighting elements of Germany's colonial past. Similarly, thanks, for example, to public negotiations, like the German government's much disputed financial aid payments to Namibia, formerly German South West Africa, the planned repatriation of the Benin bronzes from the Humboldt Forum in Berlin, and information about the impact of colonialism and imperialism available on internet platforms, German citizens certainly have become more aware of colonial crimes and the legacy of colonial racism. However, many aspects of Germany's official treatment of colonial history are still problematic. The continuing presence of colonial street names like Herrero Straza or Togo Straza here in Munich, for example, or the lack of a standardized approach to education about German colonial violence at state or federal level need to be addressed. Official and public reactions to the recent case of Vinnetou in Germany also demonstrates notable colonial amnesia within this former empire. In August 2022, a new German children's film, The Young Chief Vinnetou, was released based on the fictional books by Karl May, which were published from the 1870s to the early 1900s and set in the American Wild West. The film, like the book, reproduces harmful racist stereotypes about the indigenous people of North America and furthers a romanticized and unrealistic picture of the history of the colonization and settlement of the American West. Despite its clearly problematic nature, Certain newspapers, actors, and German politicians have spoken out in favor of the film, arguing that the film is clearly fictional and that, the Germ and that German cultural idols like Winnetou should not be subjected to cancel culture. In the UK, similar problems also came to light while this volume was being prepared over the last two years. While the UK experienced protests spurred on by the Black Lives Matter movement and increased calls for the decolonization of museums, public educational institutions, curricula and public spaces, certain British historians and politicians took issue with comments regarding the lack of critical analysis of the British Empire in the national curriculum and in universities. To a large extent, these legitimate concerns were met with counter, counter accusations of cancel culture by the British government and by certain academics. So to briefly conclude on these background debates, in the UK, the, the Holocaust is the crime of another nation, and Britain's actions during World War II are understood as a victory. Although certain institutions are trying to better situate the Holocaust in wider contexts, for example, the Wiener Holocaust Library, generally speaking, rather than engaging with examples of expansionary violence, conquest, and racism from its own past, which arguably had a profound influence on present day national identity and societal institutional structures, the UK has chosen to focus instead on a promise to remember the Holocaust. In Germany, the Holocaust is rightly seen as a national tragedy a subject that all Germans must learn about. However, despite the significant progress in openly and critically assessing and also remembering the darker parts of its complex history, Germany is still engaging, or to an extent failing to engage, in a colonial Vergangenheitsbewältigung, or a coming to terms with the past. Of course, Holocaust education and remembrance culture is not something negative in itself, but the problem comes about when other significant aspects of national history traces of which we can still see today, are not remembered, misremembered, or are not discussed in schools or institutions at all. Holocaust remembrance culture and education in the public sphere should be supplemented by a nuanced critical engagement with national histories, which incorporates the many complexities of the impact of imperialism and colonialism.
So as well as the academic debates, which Michelle described, the volume highlights these considerations on how the entanglements, but also the conflicts between the Holocaust and colonial histories exist in the public and political sphere. And so with that, I'd like to end this very brief introduction, and then we look forward to hearing from Alexandra and DeRosa and comments and questions later on in the discussion. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you both. So yes, I think we're going to hear from Alexandra now. Thank you very much. Um, I'll share my presentation. Um, uh, I'm very happy to be here, and but I believe that my uh, chapter is uh, on the periphery of this volume. Uh, but um, I hope that uh, it sheds some light uh, on the topic of the discussion. Um, it was thought as a, a conceived as a kind of provocation and. Uh, it describes uh, a very strange phenomenon of uh, Eastern Central Europe as terra incognita in uh, uh, post-colonial Holocaust studies. And I would like to start with my favorite map uh, that I think um, explains a lot. It's a map, uh, first map from the Martin uh, Gilbert's Atlas of the Holocaust from 1982. Uh, it's a like introductory picture uh, that doesn't really have a, a much in common with the next uh, 300 maps. But it shows very well uh, what's the problem with the uh, uh, Western Holocaust studies. Uh, it's uh, representative of like modern cartographic paradigm. Uh, and uh, in the center of this map, we can see instead of like Paris or Berlin, uh, as we are used to, uh, we can see Auschwitz. And the lines to, the, uh, to Auschwitz uh, are the railway tracks uh, that comes from mostly Western Europe. And what's interesting in this map is that, of course, the, uh, is the blank space on the right side, uh, which is the east, where uh, most of the Holocaust victims uh, lived and died. So uh, somehow a uh, map uh, from, the, uh, from uh, Gilbert's Atlas uh, is like a fascinating document of misrepresentation of the Holocaust. And it shows very well uh, what, uh, how Holocaust studies um, were conceived and how they have changed in recent years. Um, so what's interesting here is, of course, that the East is kind of blank, but also that um, um, the Auschwitz is actually like the only uh, the only uh, extermination camp. And if we compare it to the uh, very popular map by uh, Yahad in Unum, uh, Holocaust by Bullets, we can see uh, what's the difference between like this uh, these two these two representations. So. Um, um, even if uh, uh, next of uh, next of Gilbert's uh, atlas, uh, like next maps from Gilbert's atlas, are completely different, and often they represent so-called tender geography of uh, the Holocaust and uh, fates of the victims. Uh, I would say that um, this is somehow representative for like um, um, how uh, how East was uh, was represented and conceived in uh, Western Holocaust studies. So East was uh, the place where unspeakable uh, atrocities happened, but also, uh, but very often like ordering, orientalizing, or even colonial uh, imagery uh, happened to be employed to, um, to like talk and represent these terrains. So I'm interested here in, in the ways in which East Central Europe is conceived as Holocaust space and how these preconceptions may be interpreted as an after effect of long-standing uh, imaginative division between East and West. So I examine visual and conceptual tropes uh, of ordering geography of the East in Western Holocaust scholarship, as well as literary and visual representation. And there are like three clusters of these uh, Im images I'm interested in. They are related to landscape, people, and larger philosophical and geographical concepts uh, and uh, I will uh, shortly present these clusters. And then in concluding remarks, I will propose how we can counter map uh, the East um, thinking about the Holocaust. So my frame framework here is intersection of Holocaust studies and post-colonial studies, but I'm not so much interested or focused on uh, deciding about uh, correlation or causation, but rather uh, I'm interested in imagination and like representative tropes that are uh, still with us uh, for many, many years. So I'm interested how Eastern Europe was uh, constructed as colonial space in German culture and politics. And I'm mostly um, 
um, I'm mostly like, uh, quoting and working with the concepts of Christine Kopp and Leni Urania Valerio, who showed how uh, Poland and uh, Eastern Europe was conceived as wild east, uh, ready to be civilized, uh, like Lebensraum of German folk, um, like ready to ready to be conquered. Uh, but as I show, these uh, ideas of um, Eastern Europe are not uh, uh, so young, but rather uh, come from uh, from much earlier period, period of uh, of um, um, of uh, um, enlightenment. So I'm uh, also uh, taking from Larry Wolf the idea of inventing Eastern Europe, and uh, Wolf uh, also actually shows how. Uh, Eastern Europe was like uh, a concept of demi-orientalization and uh, this demi-orientalization happened via uh, representation, by maps, uh, by, uh, by literature, and uh, that uh, Eastern Europe was, uh, um, was shown as uh, uh, awaiting civilization, uh, very beautiful, uh, but in, inhabited by, uh, by um, like backwards barbarians speaking uncomprehensible languages. So these figures of uh, landscape, uh, people, and language uh, are still um, uh, still present in the in the Holocaust representation, and the figure of traveler, uh, uh, Western traveler who uh, like ventures into terra incognita of Eastern Europe, post Holocaust of Eastern Europe, it comes back to uh, talk about their adventures is still a very alluring image, and I would like to uh, shortly show you several like uh, main tropes and. Um, like um, uh, examples of these tropes uh, in, in Holocaust representation. So first is uh, the landscape, the landscape that is considered uh, very beautiful, but at the, same, at the same time sinister. So of course, the Locus Classicus here is Claude Landsman's uh, Shoah. Um, it is very, uh, I have very nice quotes from the, from the first uh, reception of, uh, of, uh, of Shoah. So there is an unforgettably sinister beauty of, uh, to the footage Landsman took in Poland, uh, Variety uh, wrote, and also Simone de Beauvoir um, stated that she would never have imagined such a combination of beauty and horror. And this is like a very prevalent trope of thinking about uh, this post-Holocaust, post-genocidal uh, uh, East, East Eastern European landscape. And it's very often um, employed in the, um, in the works by second generation uh, Jews who uh, try to like uh, imagine what happened to their parents and they often go to the uh, to Eastern Europe to somehow unearth uh, this experience. So very often in the memoirs um, and fiction books uh, we can like uh, um, we can read about this scandalous idol of Eastern Europe. I have several quotes here, like from um, Everything is Illuminated, for instance, uh, where, where the narrator uh, states that it was absolutely beautiful, or Simon Shama Landscape and Memory, uh, when he ponders on this like shocking, uh, shocking contrast between what happened and the beautiful and brilliantly vivid um, countryside, uh, countryside landscape of Treblinka. Second, very similar trope is a uh, trope of emptiness and ab absence. This is very much like visual trope from cinemato uh, French cinematography, not only uh, Landsman Shoah, but also uh, Alain René, A Night and Fog. And again, I have a series of second generation, uh, this time uh, visual uh, works, uh, Michael Levin War Story, where we can see this exactly this emptiness uh, magnified, or Susan Silas Helbrecht's walk. walk or my favorite here, Empty uh, Origerst White Noise. Um, this is an artistic work that was um, based on, um, um, on a memoir by Martin Gilbert. And uh, Origerst uh, followed the steps of Martin Gilbert in this post genocidal Poland. And uh, he made a series of photographs from train between uh, Belgians and Auschwitz. And we can see here exactly like this homogenized uh, uh, landscape that connects only uh, to uh, death centers and there's like nothing else, like it's completely um, abstract. And uh, another trope of uh, visualizing this uh, post-genocidal landscape is, um, is Eastern Europe as a place of vanished Jewish life. And I have uh, here two pictures. Uh, one comes from Jason Francisco's An Unfinished Memory Project. And um, uh, Francisco's photos uh, are usually taken in um, Eastern Galicia, so now Ukraine. 
Um, they are often empty. Always uh, pictures are taken in either early spring or late autumn. So really ugly seasons in Eastern Europe when everything is gray and, um, and like leafless and so on. So uh, he shows these um, uh, landscapes with like um, obvious kind of like moral, um, uh, moral, uh, um, a moral view of like uh, superiority that uh, he shows how these landscapes are abandoned and uh, completely neglected. Similar views we have in Wojciech Wilczyk's Polish artist's uh, book, There is no such thing as an innocent eye. He portrays the abandoned uh, synagogues and prayer houses in Poland. But what's interesting here in uh, Wilczyk's book is the very title that somehow shows that everybody is somehow complicit to, uh, to what, we, what we see. So um, then apart from the landscape, there are people. And uh, again, uh, Landsman is my uh, main example. Landsman who shows himself as this kind of explorer of post-genocidal void. There is a famous quote from his memoir when he states, uh, Treblinka existed, Treblinka dared to exist. And uh, this view of Poland that is like backward and completely stagnant, and he like ventures into the, this land to then uh, tell us the story is very strong. So uh, there, there were many, I mean, many discussions how, uh, how Landsman uh, chose his witnesses, eyewitnesses or bystanders. There are always uh, peasants, usually, I mean, not always, but usually peasants, Polish peasants. And they, he, uh, he calls them in one of the interviews, uh, dumb, deaf and blind. So um, this is like very much uh, prevailing, uh, prevailing stereotype of, uh, of uh, these uh, dwellers of post-genocidal void. I really like one moment uh, from the outtakes of uh, Shoah where uh, when uh, um, Landsman uh, visits Treblinka and talks to the Treblinka's kids and this absolute misunderstandings between them uh, are great material to, uh, to see this difference. And another uh, visual uh, example is a photograph by James Friedman, a photograph taken in Treblinka, which might be uh, like shocking because we see here present with a sign, and this is not uh, something we would expect in Treblinka post-industrial genocide landscape. Uh, here again, we have like this uh, idea of, uh, of Eastern Europe as some kind of like backward, stagnant, uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely like frozen in time uh, terrain. So uh, my third, uh, like third cluster of uh, of uh, images I uh, I uh, analyze uh, are like um, more like bigger geographical and um, uh, philosophical concepts uh, that essentialize the East. So we have of course famous bloodlands by Snyder, and these bloodlands are a really good example because they show like bloodshed or blood stain. How like blood here like changes the ontological status of lands that were conquered, but they here are uh, they are shown as something essentially essentially like connected to blood. And other uh, examples are very similar, Black Earth or Contaminated Landschaften by Polak, on Winston's Dark Heart uh, of Europe or Terrains of Devil's Work, and finally Jakarias and Minka's Selva and uh, the fact that Selva is a, um, is a place where in um, uh, where um, uh, in the Yes, it's a, it's a place uh, which is uh, the same as uh, hell. So here uh, I have uh, my favorite example of map uh, of bloodlands from uh, Snyder's book. All right, so um, these uh, examples show how, um, how Eastern Europe have been by figures, uh, uh, by aestheticizing landscape, ordering their, uh, its inhabitants and homogenizing identity, how Eastern Europe was other, uh, other, has been ordered in Holocaust studies. And this situation, of course, changes a lot because the whole uh, landscape of like producing knowledge changes. But uh, I would like to shortly um, uh, conclude with uh, a proposition of like thinking about counter mappings of Eastern Europe, because I think that the fact that Eastern Europe was so much, uh, so much ordered, it also shows us the general problem with uh, space regarding the Holocaust, how Holocaust disrupted the space of like uh, experience of the victims and somehow this othering Eastern Europe, I think it's a, a, some, uh, somehow it's a, um, it comes from, uh, from this like bigger philosophical pro uh, problem. So Hannah Pauline Galay in one of her papers uh, wrote about like black holes in uh, survivor's testimony, these places that are going against the conventional geography. 
And I also want to think not only about black holes, but blank spaces of Eastern Europe and how we can counter map with them. So I think uh, since I'm interested in maps, I think maps are great uh, and mappings are great counter mappings. And I would like to just shortly uh, tell you about counter mappings uh, made by survivors in e score books, for instance, uh, or um, survivors very often show maps during their video testimonies and narrate their, um, their experience via maps. Uh, here I'm giving you some examples. But also we can look at actually eye, uh, eyewitnesses or bystanders, how they uh, imagined this, uh, this like, tender geographies of the Holocaust by maps. And these are either maps that were uh, asked for by official Polish um, uh, institutions <clears throat> in 60s, for instance, or made by themselves as here we have like eyewitness uh, Stanislav Zbawa who made his maps. Uh, these maps are used by a uh, Forgotten Foundation uh, that now tries to uh, somehow commemorate this, uh, this dispersed uh, rural Holocaust uh, that is com something completely different than this blank, blank East. And finally, I'm very much interested how gestures and walks can like counter map uh, Eastern Europe as a post-genocidal space, uh, walks that are uh, uh, they, they are recorded by, uh, for instance, uh, institutions that record the eyewitnesses, but also in the survivors, um, in survivors like private archives. Here we can see Samuel Wasserstein who comes back to Jedwabne and shows his family where he was hiding and somehow like recreates this space of the very intimate Holocaust. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexandra. That was really fascinating. Um, and now we're going to turn um, to Dorota to tell us a bit about her contribution to the volume. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me both to participate in the volume and in this uh, important event. Um, I am speaking from Canada, Chabaktak, uh, or Halifax, uh, which is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. And um, this acknowledgement uh, is not just something that we do in Canada. It is uh, meaningful to me since my chapter uh, primarily draws on indigenous thinkers and knowledge holders engagement uh, with the concept of cultural genocide. And then I propose to look at the annihilation of Eastern European Jews uh, through the uh, during the Holocaust uh, through that lens. Uh, so I, I take a different approach by my conclusions uh, converge with Alexandra's almost uncannily. Um, so cultural genocide uh, was first introduced or um, cultural elements of genocide was, uh, was first introduced by Lemkin in Axis Rule and Occupied Rule in Europe in 44. Then he proposed to include it in the Genocide Convention, which was signed in 48. In the final version of the convention, um, the article on cultural genocide was eliminated and different motives were given, but uh, let us note that uh, the post-war context uh, in which the term cultural genocide first emerged, uh, the beginnings of the struggle for decolonization, uh, that context was imbued with uh, imperialist ideologies and colonial ideas about which cultures were worthy of uh, being preserved. Uh, so this, uh, to make it short, leads me to reflect on North American mournful remembrance of the world of Eastern European Jews as the vanished world, uh, and that's what Alexandra pointed out as well, and to note a certain ideological proximity of this view and, and the settler colonial conception of the vanishing Native American race. I'm thinking of the Vinatu example here. Uh, namely, I propose that uh, the memorial trope of the vanished world actually betrays a certain colonial mindset that lurks in North American conceptions of the Holocaust, perhaps in Holocaust studies as, as a discipline. And I argue that uh, certain colonial inflections in valuations of world cultures as an essentialist uh, conception of what constitutes a culture can be detected in Lemkin's own writings. Uh, such as in his well-known account of the extinction of uh, Tasmanians who perished, as Lenkin writes, in the encounter with civilization. And there is a contribution in this volume by Jack Palmer uh, that um, unpacks that idea. Uh, although, even though Lemkin was careful to uh, distinguish natural processes of cultural change and assimilation uh, from genocidal forced assimilation compounded uh, with physical destruction, uh, but still, uh, Lemkin's um, 
uh, conceptualization of cultural genocide, uh, which focused on aggressive and deliberate assaults on cultures, did not account for the full extent of this long duress settler colonial violence in North America, uh, especially the practices that were carried out under this veneer of benevolence and civilizational progress. And uh, the prime uh, instance of that were boarding and residential schools, which now we know were lethally destructive to indigenous communities. Uh, so in Canada, the term cultural genocide entered the public discourse in 2015 uh, with the findings of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that defined it as, I quote, the destruction of those structures and practices uh, that allow the group to continue as a group. But soon after criticisms emerged that the Canadian government has appropriated the commission's conclusions and focused on the reparations for the harms of residential schools uh, in order to uh, conceive the full extent of genocidal harm and to deflect indigenous demands uh, for political sovereignty and land repatriation. And uh, since settler colonial violence was not officially recognized as genocide under the convention, uh, referring to the entirety of this harm as cultural genocide might make it appear as less real. And I'm quoting uh, Patrick Wolf's expression. So in my reading, uh, this debacle itself is an inevitable result of the understanding of culture and uh, the annihilation of culture, of course, as, as if separate from the physical and biological survival of, of a group, or to put it differently with the exclusion of cultural genocide from the convention, uh, the ontological and political significance of cultural genocide was eliminated. Um, I didn't find evidence that Lemkin considered the destruction of Eastern European Jews on the continuum of settler colonial violence per se. Uh, now that is a bulk of research that, as we heard uh, from Thomas Poon, uh, that makes this argument generally about Hitler's eastward expansion. Um, the concept of cultural genocide has not been used in Holocaust scholarship in relation to the Nazi eradication of Eastern European heritage. Uh, with one and notable exception, the authors are uh, focused on showing uh, the impact of this exclusion on the uh, Jewish post-war effort uh, to recover and restore Jewish cultural heritage. Uh, we, of course, know that Nazi Germany engaged in a deliberate, systematic assault on Jewish cultural heritage. This is the pattern that is consistent with genocidal campaigns, both prior to the Holocaust and, and those per perpetrated more recently. Um, already in Germany of the 1930s, the destruction of Jewish books, libraries, places of worship, uh, preceded physical annihilation, was carried in the form of public spectacles, uh, which indicates that these acts had a very important symbolic function. And then, of course, in the 1940s, this pace of cultural destruction accelerates, uh, while at the same time, a, a section of Alfred Rosenberg's task force loots valuable books, uh, documents, artifacts with the purpose of establishing collections that would keep the mementos of the extinct Jewish race for future research. Uh, so um, to state the obvious, even though um, some of these cultural materials uh, survived and Jewish communities eventually flourished in North America and Israel and, and elsewhere, the culture of Eastern European Jews was extinguished. And then it re-emerged as a mournful cliche of the vanished world. And uh, I look closely at um, these most iconic representations uh, in Roman Vishniak's photographs. And then I juxtapose these representations with the, the many representations of the settler colonial myth of the vanishing Native American. Uh, think George Caitlin's portraits, uh, books by James Fenimore Cooper, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in North American colonial societies, genocidal, genocidal colonial practices were supplanted with nostalgic portrayals of the members of the dying race. And, kind of uh, couching these attitudes of racial superiority in the idiom of uh, civilizational benefits, uh, with, which further served to justify the expropriation of indigenous lands. Uh, so the social construction of the vanishing people conveys 
a conception of a group's culture as this nostalgic artifact worthy of preservation only insofar as it is separate from its physical existence, which, which is uh, doomed to be extinguished. Um, so um, these are representations of a culture as worthy of preservation only as a specimen of the past, uh, stripped of historical, ontological, and political significance, uh, prevent the recognition of the group's contribution to the wealth of all humanity, to quote Lemkin, and that was his rationale for including cultural genocide in the convention. As, and it is this stagnant, apolitical conception of culture that has been critiqued by indigenous thinkers in the context of the debates about cultural genocide. So the destruction of cultural identity of Eastern European Yiddishkeit befell the entirety of um, Eastern European Jewry, uh, who prior to the Holocaust were deeply rooted in the places they inhabited and where their ancestors were buried. So unlike uh, colonial mass violence, uh, the attempted annihilation of European Jews has been fully recognized as an exemplary genocide under the official UN definition. But then on the other hand, uh, uh, largely due to the exclusion of cultural genocide from the definition, the destruction of Eastern European Jewish culture has been perceived as less real, uh, stripping it of historical context, obscuring the full scope of its catastrophic impact. So I argue that this comparative engagement with the concept of cultural genocide brings to light a pattern of implicit valuations of cultures as such, it reveals uh, that this uh, vanished world of East European Jews is largely a colonial metaphor inflected with Western cultural superiority. And this narrow conception of the Jewish catastrophe has resulted in a diminished view of the plurality, vitality, and unfulfilled potential of Eastern European Jewish life. And so in that sense, indigenous thinkers' insights into the meaning of cultural loss due to genocidal violence, I believe can shed light on our understanding of cultural loss during the Holocaust uh, and its full political, epistemic, ontological consequences. So why in some of my earlier work, I looked at evocations of the Holocaust by indigenous uh, scholars to show that they drew on these comparisons to bring to light the genocide of violence of settler uh, colonialism in the course of that research, which mainly involved reading works by indigenous thinkers, my own understanding of the Holocaust significantly changed. And to realize that Western remembrance of Eastern European Jews has been uh, partly shaped by the same knowledge paradigm that was used to legitimate genocidal violence against indigenous cultures is, is troubling. And that's what makes decolonizing Holocaust studies as a discipline of knowledge necessary. Uh, so maybe I just wistfully add that in the context of current restoration projects of uh, Jewish cultural heritage in Central Eastern Europe, engaging with the concept of cultural genocide uh, might uh, also allow us to imagine forms of Eastern European Jewish futurity and cultural renewal. Uh, that's the possibility that this metaphor of the vanished world has foreclosed. Thank you. Thank you um, very much, uh, Dorota. Um, that was great. Um, so the, we, we've covered a huge amount of um, ground there. So I'm going to attempt. I'm going to sort of attempt to um, kick things off for our, the, the little bit of time we've got for a bit of discussion by actually in, incorporating a question that has come from the audience um, from Ronan, um, which, is, which is to do with um, whether we're looking at applying the Holocaust paradigm to the study of colonialism or applying the paradigm of colonialism to the study of the Holocaust. And you know, one thing that I think is quite striking from what a few of you have said is the way that sometimes the, the kind of um, perhaps language of colonialism gets incorporated into discussions of the Holocaust without really much kind of thought or analysis of that perhaps sometimes. Um, there's also um, a lot of, um, I suppose, um, forgetting 
um, and imaginary projections as well that are going on, um, perhaps in different cases that often um, have parallels and differences. So the, there's a lot there, but I thought perhaps um, it might be worth starting by looking at Roman's question and, and perhaps both things occur, but I don't know, that's, it's really a question perhaps um, for Thomas or Michelle or Rachel really. I don't know who would like to go. Thomas, do you want to comment first and then I'll perhaps go to one of the others. Uh, <clears throat> I'm happy to do so. Uh, Ronan, I, I think you are right to a certain degree that uh, colonialism has been studied under the paradigm of the Holocaust, but the debate about the link between the two, uh, the debate about that link uh, is yeah, pretty much revolves around the idea that we better, that we need to understand the Holocaust uh, by drawing continuities to the to colonialism. So that I think th and that is the case also in this book, in my view. Um, the, the focus is still the Holocaust. Yeah, we, we study colonialism to better understand the Holocaust. That's the idea. That is what drives this debate. The scholarly part of it. Thank you. Um, Michelle. Um, so, yes, I think that the, the problem with thinking about colonial violence and the Holocaust, of course, is this notion that we're trying to somehow either upgrade colonial violence because of this association to the Holocaust, or that we can only somehow look at colonial violence in that context. And of course, particularly colonial historians that do look at these issues of mass violence, that's, I would argue, the very opposite of what they're trying to do, because they're trying to look at these cases in and of themselves. And of course, these broader contexts and processes and connections are, I would say, of secondary interest in that sense. So, for example, when I write about the colonial violence in the British Empire, I do so from a knowledge of the background of Holocaust and genocide studies, but it is not to inform the Holocaust that I do that. I do that to study colonial violence in and of itself committed by Europeans. Um, to the second part of the question about applying a, a paradigm of colonialism to the study of the Holocaust, I would say that certainly people do do that work. And the uh, relevance of thinking about a Nazi empire and not specifically, obviously, just the destruction of uh, European Jewry is, is a very fruitful one because all of these things all of these processes are, are, of course, overlapping. The way in which the Holocaust unfolded was affected by other Nazi mass violence targeting other groups, for example. Um, I also thought, um, yeah, no, actually, I'll let, I'll let Rachel continue on from there. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle, and thanks for the question. Um, yeah, for example, in my case, I'm a historian working at the Center for Holocaust Studies. So I'm surrounded every day with topics very Holocaust related, very specific to the Holocaust, yet I still bring in this, this colonial paradigm to my work, although I wouldn't consider myself a colonial historian. Um, and I guess as as Michelle alluded to, um, certainly in, in my work, and I think it's sort of come across maybe in the volume a little bit, um, I think occasionally we have the tendency to, to separate the Holocaust a little bit from the Nazi regime and Nazi expansion. And in my mind, we, we can't do that because the Holocaust is a significant part of this expansionary drive towards the east a complete reordering of population whether that's exclusionary reordering as is the case with the jews or whether it's inclusionary reordering so that's for example these germanization or assimilation processes um, and so as, as i guess thomas alluded to um, when we look at the the murder of the european jews yes that can strike us as something very different to colonial models and, and i agree with him there that that's something that isn't so comparable when we look at this victim group however if we look at the holocaust as a part of this wider nazi enterprise and we take parts of this enterprise and we say could these parts be viewed from a colonial perspective or a colonial, um, could they in some way be compared to colonial context, then I think the picture, the sort of pieces of the puzzle 
fit a bit neater together, as it were. Um, so I hope that sort of answers your your question. Thomas, any further thoughts on that? Not at this point, no. Okay, thank you. And and so, um, Rachel and Michelle, would you would you then do you sort of accept what Thomas said about um, the colonial paradigm not really sort of explaining the full dimensions of um, of the Holocaust? Uh, yes, absolutely. And of course, scholars have made some very interesting attempts to do so, of course, including Dirk Moses's notion of a Sir Walton genocide in the Holocaust case. Um, but again, as I kind of uh, alluded to before, and Rachel a bit as well, it's more this, this once we yeah, integrate the Holocaust into these wider policies and see these overlaps, and not only with colonial policies, but I see as well, there was a question about economic motivation. And of course, at various points, different aspects came to the fore in which then affected, of course, the unfolding of the Holocaust, such as the war effort, for example. Um, so, yeah. It's me. <laughs> and I think in terms of um, uh, sort of maybe everyday collaboration, I think, you know, David Cesarani was quite keen to, in a way, point to people at a at a low low level perpetrator level people's economic motivations in this in a sense in terms of looting and um that kind of aspect but um so uh, just just one more thing kind of on this this area just wondered if any of you had um any comments to make on on the sort of specific history of anti-semitism in relation to the holocaust and, and whether that is something that that is is easily comparable to um, motivations underlying mass violence in colonial circumstances, or, or whether that is a, is a somewhat separate, well, it is obviously a separate history, but whether it's not really a comparable history or not. So I just wondered if, if any of you um, three would like to comment on, on that before I'll sort of try and bring in Alexandra and Drosha as well. So I don't know, Rachel, any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, yeah so as I sort of, touched on um, anti-Semitism, the idea that um, the driving force of the Holocaust is the extermination of not just German Jews, not just Polish Jews, Jews but the European Jews in general. Um, we, don't, we don't see that so much in this colonial setting. I mean, I do occasionally, um, certainly in my research, come up against um, criticisms to an extent. How, how could we apply a colonial paradigm um, in terms of this destruction of, of white people, of European people, the Germans are exterminating people who look like them. Um, and I think that this idea of um, skin color, actually it's, it's not quite so relevant um, because for example, we do have colonial examples of people who look like one another, but yet still the differences are are there in a way as from the colonizer view for example um english the english colonization of ireland and to this day we still perceive these differences whether they exist or not um and also if we look to german southwest africa for example um often it wasn't the, the differentiation wasn't based on the color of someone's skin it was actually based on their ancestors who their parents were so even if someone looked outwardly white they under the german system they were not necessarily categorized as such um, but as i said um, with with anti-semitism it is it is a harder model to fit at, fit but um, the colonial paradigm in my mind is not the solution to every question. Um, it is bringing up another approach, another way of looking at it. And one thing that I don't think we really, I mean, I think DeRosa maybe touched on it a bit, but by looking at the Holocaust um, from this colonial perspective, we're also looking at it in a way that's not this, this European centered one. And in my mind, we're bringing in other voices that otherwise are sometimes not heard in this field of research, um, whether it be from, from the global south or parts of America. Um, people who still have a background in, in genocide studies, in, in trauma. Um, and I think if, if not for the, the sort of pure historical research, at least in terms of how we, we decolonize the field in itself, I think it's, it's very important. Thank you very much. 
Um, one thing that sort of struck me listening to all of you um, speak was, um, I suppose, perhaps the role in some senses of, of different forms of imaginative kind of projections from Thomas, what you said about Hitler's, um, you know, perhaps, you know, wasn't really sort of exactly implementing some model of colonial mass violence, but, but somewhat inspired by his own sort of fragmentary, distorted understandings of different moments of, of colonial history. Um, you know, to, to perhaps what Alexandra and Dorota were talking about in terms of um, notions um, and um, constructions of ideas about Eastern Europe or Jews in Eastern Europe or um, almost nostalgic ideas about um, vanished people, which perhaps serve to distort who these people really are. So um, this was this was just something that that quite struck me as something that came out of the different um, different kind of topics that and quite varied topics that we've been. Um, covering. So I don't know if I've entirely got a question there, but I just wondered if anyone wanted to sort of comment, including Alexandra or Dorota, on that kind of the, the role in terms of both um, motivations and even what we've just been mentioning about anti-Semitism and race and, and how these ideas are um, constructed. Um, and then the memory afterwards and the way that this is kind of misremembered and flattened perhaps through ideas like vanished worlds and, and so on. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to say anything there. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bit of a vague question. But. Um, Dorota, she's still there. No. Alexandra, um, what, are, what about you? I mean, you, you focused very much on um, the Eastern European example. Um, and do you sort of see any parallels with other other kind of ways that things are remembered or misremembered? Um, I think what I'm interested in is like how certain ways of thinking about uh, the inferior uh, terrains or inferior people uh, are uh, similar. And uh, this is how this uh, colonial lens uh, somehow works because uh, uh, it, we can think about uh, very different, um, uh, very different environments or uh, places in uh, in the map of uh, world. Uh, if we can think about like people who like barbarians and landscapes, they are beautiful, but they are waiting for to be like explored. So uh, what interests me here is that of course the problem of anti-Semitism and the uniqueness of Holocaust is important, but also, but. Uh, the very fact that uh, some um, uh, some ways of perceiving the inferior lands uh, are uh, are everywhere, and uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, require only like the Holocaust context, but also colonial context, uh, really interests me. So um, yeah, so uh, of course it's not. Um, I mean, here we have a problem. Like if we read the uh, like colonial statements of explorers of Africa or South America. So uh, some examples will be like really strikingly similar, uh, like these figures of landscape and people uh, are, and the figure of explorer is really like omnipresent everywhere. So this is what's uh, fascinating for me. Yes, and I suppose your, you know, your, um, your presentation kind of, and your chapter sort of emphasize how, um, you know, sometimes there's, there's, there's a, a call understandably for more research to be done into the mass violence in colonial context, which has sometimes seemed to be under-researched and um, overlooked, but equally within the Holocaust, there are aspects um, which have not come in for so much um, attention and research as, as other features. So I suppose um, it's, it's kind of all relevant there so yes Christine's so, just said um so, any more questions from the audience then feel oh can I can free. I can I follow up quickly yeah oh no sorry. absolutely yeah, I yeah. just realized I was muted before um oh yes uh, sorry <laughs> sorry <laughs> it's okay yes. go ahead, go um, ahead. Well, one thing I wanted to say to kind of respond to to Thomas's comment is uh uh I'm not sure if we can really distinguish between imagination and knowledge to that extent. I would, wouldn't want to underestimate to what extent 
epistemic regimes are really inflected by you know imaginary fanciful and, and even affective dimensions so that's just just one point uh, in terms of comparisons i'm thinking about uh, the kind of colonial impulse to collect and in my paper i'm sort of drawing attention to the similarities and that's across the colonial spectrum this kind of commemoration of the extinct race uh, that uh, that corresponds to this, this um, murderous, you know, attempt to eliminate it, and uh, how our institutions of knowledge, uh, including universities and museums, are sort of invested and founded upon these kind of uh, impulses to collect. Uh, so this is a very general remark, but I think what what this leads me to to conclude is that um, I don't think we can ever. Uh, explain the full extent of the Holocaust because obviously these debates always take place in situated contexts in our various locations. So the debates themselves always, always uh, evolve, right? There will never be like the ultimate picture. We will never get to the end of the debate. And uh, in Canada, the context is the one I'm interested in of the the a uh, struggle of indigenous people for resurgence and self-determination. So the debate on the Holocaust for me is not just to illuminate the Holocaust, but to participate in what is important in my particular context. My other context is I'm a descendant of Eastern European Jews. I am an Eastern European Jew. So this is always a situated contextualized and present knowledge that informs these debates. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Just a brief comment, uh, Dorota, and to, to others. Um, my point here was that, I mean, this book gives a lot of incentives to further study uh, this relation. But my point is that, I mean, Dorota, you said that we can never fully explain the Holocaust. That may be true. Uh, however, I think in order to explain it as best as we can, we need to renounce of the idea that there is one concept that explains everything. Uh, what I mean, as probably most of you will agree, the Nazis were extremely yeah. effective in their destructiveness. And this extraordinary effective, destructive effectiveness um, was a result that they combined different traditions and different visions. Yeah? Or combination is like maybe the wrong word, uh, that they amalgamated. Uh, different traditions, and the colonial one is is one of many. Yeah, it's not not the overarching or dominant one. That is uh, that is my point. And anti-Semitism is not the only one. Yeah, the Nazis were successful in merging different. I mean, that has been said many times. Uh, there is no such thing as a Nazi ideology. It's a syncretism of different different traditions of ideology, and so the practice of violence is a syncretism of different uh, traditions. I have to unfortunately leave this meeting. I, this is was extremely exciting, <laughs> but I never have to stop now to, yeah. uh, to, end, to go to another meeting. Sorry, sorry for no, that. No, that's right. that, no, we're, we're just about at an end anyway. Thank you um, so much, Professor Kuna, for you know, your um, eliminating remarks and taking the time um, to um, come here today and contribute. We're really, really grateful and um, hope to see you again. So thank you, Thomas. So I'll just, we are sort of out of time. I'll just um, hand over to Michelle and Rachel just to see if they want to, to make any final remarks before we close the event. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, thank you again, Thomas, for your generous uh, comments and time. Um, I think, again, just to reiterate, as we've tried to do with the book, that we're really just trying to explore where these where these questions take us, and that we're obviously also not trying to argue that the colonial paradigm explains everything, nor do we try and argue that genocide would explain everything as a concept in terms of how we understand colonialism and colonial violence. It's just pulling at these threads to try and see what where it takes us in ways that we have I think that the book also demonstrates how by asking these questions, we find nuance and experiences and sufferings that aren't brought to light in the same way if we don't look at these interconnectivities. So thank you.
thank you also just very briefly from my side um yeah i completely agree with with what michelle said what what thomas said um and i think one of the important things that that the book also shows is is this movement away from an idea of any sort of rigid direct Sonderweg or continuity um, that the colonial paradigm can really be stretched out a little bit more, not only in terms of the academic debate, but also how, how we look at, at society, how we look at Holocaust studies, how we, how we understand these, these processes and what has previously informed them and what we can do to change them. And I just want to say that the Wiener Holocaust Library, thank you so much for hosting this series and and promoting these ideas um thank you thank you very much um so thanks very much to our audience and hope to see you again at future events online or in person um and thank you to our um, speakers today uh, michelle rachel alexander dorota and to um thomas who's now left and so yes um we'll put the recording of this on line at, at some point soon and with that um just remains for me to say well good afternoon if you're in britain and then goodbye to everyone else thank you thank you bye